wow, <laughs> nice to be here, maybe. <laughs> 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 so as I got started working on this talk, the first thing that came up had to do with how do I see the samadhi tank in the world? It's not shrinking, it's just everything else is growing so much faster. And so the kind of words that came to mind, I, I put it, uh, this is what I wrote. A simple, well-made, everyday, unassuming object, utilizing sturdy materials, simple forms, exacting details. The Japanese calls this appearance supernormal, a well-made object with a simplicity of purpose. The visual quality is not the most important one. Rather, it describes an unsensational-looking object that performs in a sensational way. It may take time to notice how well it works. The interests of the user and the environment are put in first place. So that's how I see our product. And I use it most every day and have been doing that for the past 43 years. <laughs> I like it. It's good for me. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Well, it's not only that. It's become a habit for me because it forms the rest of my day. It gets me started in exactly the way that I would like to be in my day. If I have a lot of you know, things going on, I want to know about it before I get up and start tackling them. Or if the day looks absolutely too full, maybe I have to cut some things back. Or if it looks perfect, I'll keep it that way. But I think it's very important for me to start my day every day with a float. And so I do that. When I'm traveling, often I can't do it. But I've been at it for such a long time that it's now in the category of habit. That's what I do. I was introduced to the tank by uh, Dr. Lilly, and so my my way of work was very much influenced by him and his ideas about be certain about what you do. You know, I'm not doing, don't do things just because people will like you for it or you're supposed to do it that way or you'll make money. And none of those things, but do it because it makes a difference in the world. You want to make a difference in the world that you live in. I want to make a difference in the world I live in. And so we, um, uh, uh, we understood that he wanted centers to happen because he was interested in people growing, what's the word? In, um, manifestations. And manifestations became conscious so that we live a conscious life and we choose the life that we live. Uh, after we were finished, Having, uh, starting with tanks at home for a couple of years, and we learned what to do, how we needed to build centers. We asked him, well, now we've put all your students through the tank, what should we do? How will we find more people to float? He says, open centers. So we started working with that, and I'm, I love stories. And so I thought I'd spend this time up here with you telling you some stories that I like very much of what happened in our first center, which was the Beverly Hill Center. Uh, and that was when we moved from our house, we moved there. And I was very interested in kids and how they took to the tank and what it was like for that, them. And I thought you might like some of these stories. I have three of them that I'd like to tell. And the first one is um, uh, there was a couple a uh, man and woman, they had a four-year-old, and uh, he was too young to float by himself. So they bring him along. We had this big area of where people could, that people could use while they were floating or waiting. And um, we give an orientation when people first come. And uh, 
the orientation used to start by saying many people have fears before they get in the first time. And whether it's called fear of darkness, drowning, suffocation, claustrophobia, well, this kid, four-year-old, uh, after the orientation was over, I asked him, you know, well, did that sound interesting to you? He said, oh, no, oh, no, darkness, I don't like the dark. And, but he and his mother had an agreement that if when he was out there coloring or whatever he wanted to do, uh, if he asked to go into the tank room that his mother was in, I could bring him back and then she would, he would be in the room with her. And he was there for maybe one year of her coming once or twice a week and he never asked to go in, he was always very busy. And then one day he said, I want to go into my mom's room. I said, okay, and I brought her back in, him back in, and he actually climbed into the tank with his mother. She put him on her chest and let him know not to get the salt water in his eyes. And then when he came out, uh, he was very happy and he looked great and he collected his stuff. And I said, well, how is the darkness? And he said, oh, well, that's the good darkness. Out there, it's the bad darkness, <laughs> okay? Well, I love that answer. And then we had um, a woman who was in her seventh month of pregnancy who was told that her baby would be a breech baby. It was not going to turn. And it would be very good if she could get that baby to turn. And so she started coming in first weekly, and then she was coming in every day, and she would tell me these stories every day. She said, I have met that baby. That baby is not going to turn. She has her own mind. She's totally self-centered. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And she's not going to turn. So she brought her husband in to float in. The, we had five rooms. He was going to be in that room. She was going to be in this room. And they were going to talk to the child and say, please, would you please turn? It's going to be better for all of us and so on. The baby turned the last day. <laughs> they were very happy. <laughs> and the third story, uh, we introduced video into the center for a short while. We wanted to see what it was like to have people be on camera before and after their float. They were going to say whatever they wanted to say beforehand, maybe how they wanted their float to go or you know, whatever it was. They just had a couple of minutes to do that. And so this woman came, and she was, had just felt the movement start in her pregnancy. And she had been waiting for that time because she wanted to meet her child in the unborn state. And so she told that to the camera, and she came out with this look of, oh my godness. And we said, well, what happened? And so she got back on camera, and she said she was in the tank, and she was just there, and she was saying, oh, I'm so eager to meet you, my baby, and you're moving around, and all this is so great. And she said that her baby came up and said, Mom, I've been waiting to meet you. <laughs> and totally, her mother was right unbelievably happy. So those were three things that happened. I think that there's a lot of work to do with little ones and, uh, and floating. I'm not sure of all the hows of that, but I met somebody here yesterday, and he has a two-year-old. I can't remember who it was I spoke with, but I told him that for his two-year-old, he might want to bring that, that two-year-old in with him on the chest, and so at any moment, if that child wanted to leave, it's easy. You just let the child leave the tank. Or if you want to know how old somebody ought to be before they can use the tank on their own, I would suggest that they have to be able to not get salt in their eyes. Because if somebody gets salt in their eyes, and I have tried this myself, when somebody asks me what happens if so-and-so happens, I try it. So I have tried that salt in the eyes. I don't like it. <laughs>
So it's, it's a simple way to check out, you know, what is okay for a kid to do. And then because if you're the parent or the one taking care of the child, then you can say, okay, I tried this myself. I don't think it's a good idea. And if you have to try it yourself, okay, I'll be right outside the door. So there are ways of doing these things that, you know, that can work. And then I want the other story. Can you, Glenn, could you make that picture come up? Yeah, that one. So being the first tank company, we had a lot of... There's a lot of ways of getting promotion for your center, or, you know, however you do in your work. If you're just having a tank at home, you don't want a lot of publicity, necessarily, you know, unless you want all your neighbors there. But we had... Um, there was a um, team in London who produced a book called The Day in the Life of London. They co collected 100 photographers. Each one chose a, something that represented London to them very strongly. And they uh, took a picture of it and put it together into a book. And then that group came to do A Day in the Life of L.A. There was a French photographer, Hans Rechelbacher, and he, met, he said, I want to talk with you. And he said, I want to show something that represents California. And so we agreed that we were going to do a picture at the beach in Malibu, having a, a baby in the tank of its mother, the mother in a tank, and the tank at the Pacific Ocean. And he allowed us to be the um, helpers on that shot. And we did, so we have this shot that was... And, oh, and the woman, how did we find her? Uh, I called a woman in, who was one of our, um, our customers and said, where will I find a pregnant woman? And she said, go to... Um, you know, she told me where to go. I called, and they said, oh, yes, I know, just the one for you. And this woman had been floating at a center in uh, Los Angeles. She wanted to be in the picture because she wanted her child to be in film at a very early age. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a fabulous photograph. It's the only one like it in the whole world, is that. So, you can get publicity in so many ways if you're open, if you're willing to share what you know with the other people who would like to know about it. And that's an example. And now we have one other shot that we took. Of, this was the second center we opened, which is, you're not going to find one prettier than this. This was San Francisco. And we had, uh, this was a 20-tank center. And it was gorgeous. This is just the, recrea the, the, the seating area. And we were only open, we uh, had a partner for a while. Uh, we only were in this partnership for a year, and uh, our partner was looking to franchise. He wanted to be the king of the new age and bring floating to the world, which was what year? 81. 80, yeah, 81. So we opened that center. And it didn't last, it only lasted a year, but it sure was pretty. And I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd just show you what an incredible center looks like. So, what my specialty is in working in centers is working with people when they come out of the tank. I, I know, and I instinctively know, what that person wants and needs, and I know how to be that way, and I also know how to teach it. And so one of the things that we thought is that with so many centers opening, if anybody wants to learn what to do, you know, the person, people who are with people coming out of the tank, if you'd like to learn how to do that kind of work, I'll teach it. So contact me. Before I do 
my short little part. Sorry. <laughs> By the way, where, uh, what where, time? Where, is, where are the papers for my talk? <laughs> uh, before I s start, start my part, I would like to encourage all of you to join FTA. And if you have a center or are going to have a center, to sign up to get more information on how you can participate in FTA doing basic research on what works for disinfection, and you can participate in that. <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about a, the most, in, if you're spiritually oriented, the most incredible job on the planet. John, in his introduction to Center of the Cyclone, said that it's, it's my firm belief that the experience of higher states of consciousness is necessary for the survival of the human species. We think consciousness is what people want and get out of floating. Even those who are doing it for medical or health reasons, if you dig down, really it's all about increasing consciousness. I'd like to tell you a little story about uh, consciousness. There was a white assembly worker who got a heart transplant. And he started, he had been listening to rock music and now he was listening to classical violin concertos. He started hanging out with black people. It turned out that a black person who was going to study violin at a music conservatory got killed and this guy got his heart. There are lots of heart transplant stories that are like that. When we float, many of us, if we float long enough and uh, often enough, we move from our mental state with all this mental chatter, we move into a heart space where we're present and we're in being. A conscious person, a more conscious person, is one who is not in fear, not in their head, but peaceful, calm, centered in their heart. Most of us do not know a lot about these heart states. And I would like to suggest that the more you learn about these states, the better you can help people coming to your center. There are two things I'd like you to consider. One is many people have fears before they use the tank. It's commonly thought that the, that the most common fear is claustrophobia. I'd like to suggest that there are two other fears that are more common than claustrophobia. 
One is that the person will find out something about themselves that they can't accept. The other one is that they will experience something that's too intense for them. Two years after Lee started floating, she had fears come up inside the tank. Forty years after I first started floating, I had a terror come up inside the tank that brought me out of the tank. Tony Lilly, John's wife, three years after she first started floating, had a terror that took her out, out the top of the tank. So I highly recommend that you let everybody know who floats in your center how to deal with fears if they come up when they're floating. It's very important to create a safe space for your floater. We've occasionally heard people say that they went to a center and they felt a demand that they talk after their float. And they were not going to go back to that center because they didn't like that. What, what we may not realize is that people who are in a heart space may be in a very delicate place and things that normally people wouldn't have any trouble with when they're in a heart space, they need special, special treatment. The other thing about a safe space is we need to be able to handle any space that the floater gets into. If a floater is experiencing something intense and comes out of the tank and you're going to be with that person, you have to be able to know how to be appropriate with that person. If, if you don't allow people to experience anything in your center, there will be people who will not gravitate to, to your center. John said, what is not allowed is forbidden. So it's important that you learn how to deal with anybody in any space and to nurture and support the kind of work that some people like to do when they come to a center. So what's incredible about being with floaters after their float is that the way to be with them is to be in the heart space yourself. So what you are doing is you are actually doing a spiritual practice when you're with those people. There's no job any more incredible 
than that on the planet. We would like to encourage you to learn how to do that so that you can grow and so that you can help save the planet, save the human species, as John says. And we'd like to help you do that. Uh, In our 44 years, Samadhi has been working to manifest John's vision and we think some of you might like to help Samadhi continue that into the future. Thank you.